Jumbo, and you are welcome. My name is Johansen Obanda. I'm Community Manager to Africa Kai. I'm so glad to join with you at the African Chatbot and AI mm -hmm. Summit. Before we start, I'm going to briefly introduce you to Africa Kai. Africa Kai is a community-led open access portal for African research communication. We aim to foster research and collaboration among African scientists to enhance the visibility of African research output and to increase collaboration globally. To allow for maximum discoverability of African research output, we work with established scholarly services, including Figshare, Zenodo, OSF, Sense Open, Chaos, and PubPub. I will now want to hand you over to my colleague, Luke, who will take you through the rest of the panel session. Thank you. Thank you so much to uh, Johansson for uh, introducing us so that we can kick off this session. And uh, I'd like to wish uh, a good morning or a good afternoon or good evening to everyone, depending on where you're tuned in and where you're watching us from. Uh, thank you so much for attending this uh, panel session. So I'll be the moderator for this session today. And my name is Luke, Luke Okello. Uh, I'm from Africa Archives, but I'm also a researcher and I'm also a lecturer in multimedia systems and next generation computing technology uh, based at the Technical University of Kenya. But I'm very excited uh, this morning uh, to be having with us uh, a panel, uh, guests who are quite notice notable. These are practitioners, these are researchers in the field of artificial intelligence, uh, both based uh, within the continent and outside the continent. So just a quick round of introductions before we get started. And as, as usual, we always start with the ladies first. So on my first guest on the panel is uh, Eunice Washu Mutai. She's a data management associate. She works with the organization called Evidence Action. This is a global nonprofit operation. Uh, they're found in several countries uh, in Africa and Asia and their work is to address the gap that's in fighting uh, against global poverty. But Eunice is also quite not notably a member of uh, Nairobi Women in Machine Learning uh, and Data Science, as well as several other organizations, uh, Africa Data Science and uh, A4AYUB. And through these platforms, she does uh, machine learning and data science, which she applies to her uh, natural language processing projects. So you're very welcome, uh, Eunice. Our next uh, guest panelist is uh, Mr. Tunde Oladimeji. Uh, Tunde is the founder of Affluence. Affluence is an African startup that works in developing voice, artificial intelligence, and speech recognition solutions for businesses. And their main focus is on accent and languages used in Africa and in the diaspora community. Mr. Tunde is an artificial intelligence expert with over 10 years experience working for Fortune 500 companies, uh, including electronics, arts, Intel, and Facebook in different roles. So it's a, a pleasure to have you, Mr. Tunde, very welcome. And our third and final uh, guest on the panelist is uh, Mr. Mutembi Kariuki. Uh, he's a Kenyan tech entrepreneur and he holds degrees both in economics and information systems. And he's currently working to bring the benefits of artificial intelligence to solving challenges in Africa through his startup known as Fastagger. Now, Mr. Mutembe believes that artificial intelligence will radically improve the quality of life for humanity. So you're very welcome as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Mr. Mutembe and all of you. So ladies and gentlemen, let's kick off our discussion in this panel. As you're aware, our topic for today is artificial intelligence and natural language processing at the intersection between uh, academics and the industry in Africa. And we're discussing the latest research uh, as well as what uh, you're working on, of course. So the audience, please uh, feel free to direct your questions, your comments, your contributions to the chat section and of any of our panelists, uh, you're free to interact with them and they'll be able to um, respond to your questions. So my first question uh, to Mr. Mutembe, we want to, uh, and then I'll open it up to everybody else as well. 
when you take stock of all the fast moving things happening on the landscape of artificial intelligence, for example, in Zambia, we have an AI app that is uh, known as Agriculture Predict, providing instant information about plant diseases. Uh, also in Cameroon, we have another artificial intelligence uh, that is carrying out detection of poachers uh, and tracking the movement of wildlife for their protection. South Africa, we also have yet another artificial intelligence uh, that works at the Kruger National Park, collecting historical data, weather and everything. So my question to you, uh, Mr. Mutembi is, could you describe in a few words how you as a practitioner or as a researcher, you keep up with the constant pace of rapid change uh, in, the, in your field? Or what type of uh, resources and materials do you find interesting to read and catch up on? Thank you very much, Luke, and it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. And so, as you said, the, the space in Africa is, is growing quite fast. There are a lot of people um, working on you know, solving a lot of challenges using artificial intelligence. And so a lot of times, you know, there's a general um, websites which are you know, chronicling African tech startups that are out there. But particularly, I want to really look at like papers in terms of what's happening around the world, cutting edge papers that are coming out. You know, these uh, papers with code, um, that's one of the platforms, I, I believe it was acquired by Facebook a few years ago. Um, that's a very good source. There's um, IBM or Gartner, uh, there's um, Towards Data Science, the platform. Um, so they have, you know, a lot of people put up um, articles there. There's, the AI for development community um, on the content is growing. And so they usually also put out a lot of information. Um, and so there's, there's the other tech for Africa uh, platforms and websites that are, that, that are there, which are all, always chronicling these startups, um, as well as you know keeping uh, abreast of information on Twitter. Um, there's a lot, there's a very big community of, of um, AI practitioners there who are always sharing what new startups are working on. So that's where I spend, you know, quite a bit of time, you know, uh, looking at papers and, you know, engaging with people in the community to see what's what they're working on. Uh, I particularly like the AI for uh, development community. Um, there's a lot that they're working on. Uh, thank you so much, Luke. Uh, I think um, for me, it's a balance. Uh, and uh, I think uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, I think it's important for, for you to kind of like uh, focus on what, uh, what you really want to do with AI, because AI is really, really broad. Um, so if you're looking at it from an educational perspective, uh, there's so much and you can easily get lost. Uh, so sometimes, like uh, Mutembe said, um, there, there are a lot of resources, AI for D, Masakane, uh, those are uh forums i try to be active in um and twitter i get a lot of information from twitter but it's kind of like a balance for me so i don't want to be too lost with what's going on but at the same time um, i want to be grounded in how i'm using ai to solve um, specific problems so the more narrow i am in understanding how i want to use ai and sometimes um, thanks to Google, you can find information when you want to like take your head out of the sand or something. So, yeah. yeah I have so, so many resources that I use. Uh, so AI4D is one of them, as they have said. And then I have, I use uh, GitHub a lot uh, to get, to just get uh, codes and collaborate with friends. Uh, also, I use uh, Medium. I read articles on Medium a lot concerning AI or any other um, application. And um, since um, I could say I'm young in the field uh, because I've done a lot of uh, academia on the same, now applying the same has been at all sometimes. And you might get confused because there's so many resources out there. You open one link and then it directs you to another, then another. So you might get lost. Uh, so I usually, um, I've been, participating in um, hackathons and competitions in on Zindi and Kaggle. Also, um, I can say having a team of 
or a group of people that have the same vision as you, it's better to have to have them for accountability and also to collaborate. So I'm in different groups for different reasons and for different AI projects. Yeah, so that's basically how I keep my balance. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eunice. I think we're seeing some common names coming out there, Zindi, Masakane, and, and a few groups on Twitter. So I, I'd like to then move on to our next uh, focus. And I'll, I'll actually stick with the um, Eunice. So we know that uh, a lot of the popular, well-established artificial intelligence industries, they tend to be located in the tech bubbles of North America, uh, Europe, and Asia. However, of course, we in Africa, we have uh, our own uh, researchers, practitioners, computer scientists, uh, such as this panel over here, which is distinguished. And we're also using artificial intelligence to solve our own complex challenges. Uh, and that has grabbed the attention actually of uh, the big tech giants. Uh, I think it's very recently that uh, IBM Research opened their first African office here in Nairobi in uh, 2013. We also have Google that recently opened their first African AI research center in April of 2019 in Ghana. Uh, but also we have uh, a popular artificial intelligence conference that's known as the International Conference of, on Learning Representation. They were supposed to have their uh, event in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia last year, but uh, due to Corona, unfortunately, it did not take place. So starting with you, Eunice, uh, maybe in a few words, you can say, how, you, how exactly are you using uh, AI or machine learning or national, uh, natural language processing? Uh, in the country that you're based in? And how do you think uh, we can use this AI to create our own tech giants uh, and to hold more conferences and make sure that we don't miss out on this uh, unique revolution of artificial intelligence? I think um, encouraging the academia to improve on the practicality of some of the concepts that are learned in data science, AI, okay, data science in general, I think that should be emphasized. And what I'm currently doing is um, I've created, I'm in the process of creating a chatbot that um, I've used data that I, I scrapped from Twitter, uh, from different uh, hashtags, uh, any that are related with jobs and because unemployment rates are so high in Kenya right now for the youths. So uh, using this data, I'm able to to find a way to match, have a model that matches the employee with the, with the job seekers. So I've been able to use the natural language processing because it's under the umbrella of artificial intelligence, just to make the machine learn on how to respond to any of the, uh, of the job seek seekers uh, text, what they write on Twitter. So I'm in the process of, of, of uh, hosting the, the bot. So um, it has taken longer than I expected, but that is one thing I'm working on. And another is for text classification. Uh, sometimes you, you realize that most people, most people uh, concentrate more on the structured data and forget about the unstructured, the images on the text. So um, I've been able to find models that uh, do topic modeling for the text data and be able to maybe highlight the major topics that have been discussed or have been raised among the concerns. And uh, yeah, yeah, I also did a project on sentiment analysis that was able to, uh, a model that was able to capture the text and, and, and predict whether um, the text shows a positive or a negative or a neutral sentiment, uh, just because I thought this could be a very good use case for maybe uh, customer satisfaction surveys for different brands to be able to know what the customers are saying about the brands. Yeah, so all yeah, no, this is a very interesting uh, question. Um, I, I, I think we're, we're at interesting times, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think the world is getting more global and definitely I think uh, uh, having African um, originated startups. I think uh, the world needs that. But I also think um, 
globally, there would also be other global companies that have um, Africans in their DNA um, as part of this journey as well. And so defining how we view Africa would, would be interesting. Uh, by that, I mean like someone like me, I have friends that we grew up, I went to college um, and everything in Africa, but I just happened to work and live in North America. Uh, but they're just a bunch of us that also still have this deep uh, connection back to the continent. And we're interested in building solutions for the continent as well. So I think this partnership between diaspora community and folks on the continent and creating uh, companies, startups, solutions, partnerships will be very, very interesting. Um, how I am using AI uh, for Africa is uh, uh, Affluence was started because uh, spending time in North America, I was able to interact with some of the uh, devices like Alexa, Siri, um, and I was frustrated that they don't uh, they don't let me communicate in African languages, right? So, and I spoke to some people within this uh, organizations and. Uh, Yes, they told me that African languages are on their roadmap because they are trying to build for the world. Um, but it was too long for me. The timeline they wanted to use to support uh, African languages was too far away in the future for me. And I think, uh, and basically that's why Affluence was started to be able to allow uh, intelligent devices understand and communicate with people uh, who speak languages that widely used in African communities and diaspora communities. So a lot of our processes is in working with languages, using NLP, AI techniques to perform speech recognition and use that to um, process speech and uh, then understand what the user is saying and also navigate them through, uh, through various uh, menus. So yeah, that I think it's interesting to look at the intersection between academia and you know commercial applications, and we are particularly focused on the fact that you know we also you know started off our company mainly focusing on um, creating labeled data sets, um, but then we saw that there's so much demand from outside the continent, right, for labeled data sets to be created. But then we started discovering that there was a big gap on the African continent because you know to do any machine learning uh, um, and deep learning or uh, NLP, you, you'll have to use label data sets a lot of times. And we just don't have this label data sets as, as um, readily available on the continent. So we started with that premise of, oh, okay, you know, there's this gap to be filled. And then we started receiving, you know, requests from, from companies that uh, had use cases, such as, you know, mining, you know, text data, like SMS data for the FinTech space. But you see, they could not understand the context of the messages, especially in different African countries where, you know, the different financial um, players will be sending different uh, messages. And, you know, we started they engaging with even organizations that are doing, you know, voice cloning. And, you know, we start realizing that this could also be used on the continent in, in you know, accents and such. And, you know, started seeing applications even in agriculture, um, you know, having these intelligence systems, um, you know, for working with farmers, um, as opposed to the, the current modes where you're sending them messages probably in English, or, you know, it's probably in, more engaging in a voice format um, with, with people. So we started um, looking for commercial applications that could be used on the African continent. The challenge is always, you know, a, a lot of times why these global companies are based in North America is because there's a ready market willing to pay for a lot of these things. And so uh, on the continent, this is just starting to happen. I think the biggest space we're seeing this is in the FinTech space for, for chatbots. And of course, COVID has accelerated that need for conversational AI in um, spaces such as banks, the, you know, managing the larger volumes of calls um, on that side. So we see an opportunity there for people who would be willing to pay for, for such services as uh, natural language understanding or NLP chatbots. So for us, we've just you know had such a commercial um, um, look at it, 
And, you know, it's been a challenge a lot of times when, you know, people will challenge you that whether the market is ready on the continent. But at the end of the day, you know, you, you create your markets to some extent, you know, by creating the, the solution so that you, you train your models um, so that they can be applicable when the, when the demand um, increases. And then you'll be the player who even the global players, when they're coming into the market, will be, you know, having conversations with you rather than them having to build things from scratch. Head of um, Google Research in Africa, that's uh, Dr. Mustafa Sisi. He said uh, that the future of machine learning uh, is in Africa, whether people know it, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, whether people know it or not, the future of machine learning is, is, is in Africa. So the question now is, uh, to, and to all of you, starting with Mr. Tude, uh, in what direction can we take this development of our industry? Uh, where can we focus next on creating either more jobs or what challenges appear interesting to you? I know you mentioned some already, but are there others that you can think you'd, you'd be interested to tackle uh, after your current challenge or alongside your current challenge? Um, I, I am super focused on um, creating this uh, easy to use experience for understanding African languages. So definitely that's my current focus. Uh, but in general, one thing that uh, I agree with that, uh, or I agree with parts of that sentiment uh, of Mustafa's thinking in terms of uh, um, there is a tremendous opportunity for AI and ML on the continent. I, I just think the time is now for us to uh, to start learning and building some of this uh, these experiences. I I feel the the thing that we need to do is demystify how AI works. Um, almost like uh, if every average African can deeply understand the concept AI concept. I think that would be fantastic. And by that, I don't mean like, cause I, I don't really think you need like a high, um, like masters or PhD to be fantastic with AI, right? So I think um, just demystifying it. And uh, I think I saw something like democratizing AI concepts and AI techniques. I think that'll be fantastic. Um, AI is basically just, uh, creating uh, systems with data, right? So if you can, uh, like Mutembe was saying, if you can find a way to create some structured data sets for any problem, you're on your way to doing AI, right? So this can be for fashion, this can be for mining, this can be for finance, this can be for language. So like just having people understand that no, like, we actually have an opportunity to define what AI is for us before the people tell us what it is. We can master this technology, um, know how to use it, know how to apply it to transform our communities. Um, I, I would love to see like secondary school students start working on AI projects, right? So that's, that's the kind of democratization that I hope uh, we get to. Uh, just the same way, like, you know, back in the days, like young kids, um, in the States and other countries, they're already working on computers while we're still doing other things, right? So just imagine if you've been coding since you're 13. So I think it would be so amazing if um, young Africans, 13, can start writing AI models, use it for games, so they're familiar with the concepts there. I think that's the future from my perspective. As I said earlier, I feel like we've been we've been used to learning the theoretical part of a uh, concept of, of, of things instead of knowing how to apply apply the, the concepts themselves. Um, people get worried so much when we start talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence because they think, oh, so if we have a chatbot, then I won't have a job because people are supposed to call me to ask me questions. The clients are supposed to call me, they're supposed to text me so that I'm able to respond. So they feel like, oh, I won't have a job. But we still need a lot of talent out there. Uh, we, we still need people who can create the user interface. So we need the devs. We need people who understand the model that they're building. And most, 
mostly you'll find uh, people deploying the model don't even understand what the model is doing. So if there's a hitch or there's a, there's a debugging that they need to do, they don't even know how to do it. So there's a lot of talent out there, even if you're trying to, to make the machines <clears throat> understand the human language. <clears throat> So yeah, so I feel that I feel like there's a lot of empowerment that needs to be done in Africa for people to actually accept that it's time to go ahead with AI. Thank you. You know, just adding on to Dr. Mustafa's quote um, that you know Africa is actually going to be the places because we have very few legacy systems on the on the continent. Um, so that creates a huge opportunity for. AI, uh, machine learning, deep learning, you know, all these technologies to come in solving the challenges that will be met by the explosion of population on the continent. It, you know, Africa will have the largest population. That means every single thing. So when Eunice mentions about some people afraid of their jobs um, going away, let's say if you're in the financial sector, in the banking sector, actually the idea is that if you have uh, chatbots dealing with the basic questions from people, then you can actually have more people engaging with the financial sector. That means you end up driving more business and that's creating more opportunities um, within the financial sector. If you have this case if in, in terms of like healthcare, like on the continent, we're just not going to be able to produce enough doctors right or or medical personnel so now chatbots and you know this technology is coming in to answer people's questions um try as much faster get people to to solve uh, their problems much faster if you're talking about customer service for different industries whether it's in you know the um, retail industry the fast mover fast moving consumer goods industry and so many spaces even entertainment you know, this will just create a lot of opportunities for people. And yes, the young people getting educated, coming in um, as techies, that's also opportunities that will be created for people. But I think generally, uh, I really do agree with the, the statement that, you know, the future actually of machine learning is on the continent because as the largest, you know, population and not having so many legacy systems, which means we actually have also a lot of problems that we haven't taken care of on the continent, then that means the application of uh, machine learning, deep learning, uh, AI technologies such as NLP will be more, it will be more, even more important in getting us to uh, deliver standards of living that are um, suitable for the population. You, you spoke about data sets and the models that you use uh, uh, to build from your data sets. So one of uh, the things that we know is uh, quite, uh, or a new saying that, that is quite popular nowadays is data is the new oil. But uh, however, there's still much of a divide in areas such as consumer protection law, financing, digital skills, et cetera. And all of this will need to be upscaled, obviously, for our continent to fully engage in AI. So uh, a lot of this data requires, uh, uh, it's personal and therefore it requires privacy and there's a, there's a lot of concerns about confidentiality. So in what ways do you use your models, the models that you build from your data sets to create a, a sense of trust between you and your users? Or how do you align the vision of the use of your technology uh, with the values of the society you, you operate in? So, so uh, first of all, in order to align my use of technology with the values of the society or the clients that I'm working with, uh, before you, before you even engage the client that you're going to build this model and it's going to do this and this and this is the data that is required, you need to to, to maybe um, explain every rule that is required, explain what kind of data you will need and what, what features will be in that data. Also, it's very possible, very important to get consent from the study, the, what are they called, the study? the participants uh, in that study that maybe you'll require data from. Uh, also, something else is that when you're dealing with data, it's very important to be aware of the data protection rules that govern that country, whether it's Nigeria or Kenya or Uganda, you need to be very aware of the data protection uh, laws so that you, 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 you're, you're able to follow each and every one of them. Uh, also some very common thing that when you, you get to building models and dealing with data sets, especially those that uh, involve uh, personal details from the human participants is, is an anony anonymity. <laughs> you have to make them anonymous, the, the, 
the people. And also you have to, um, you know, just know how to protect the data that you have. You can hide the, the identifiers that probably might uh, lead anybody to, to know you. This kind of uh, this data is from this kind of a person. So, I I think privacy is very very important and trust. In some cases, trust even more than privacy, um, in terms of their their importance level. Um, and I think some of this uh, is factored into how we think of building um, our products. Um, as a startup, we're still very early in the stage, right? So I think um, uh, we just want to have this framework of thinking into how we design our product end to end. Uh, but to comment on what Mutembe said as well in the in his last uh, statement, I why I see privacy as important, I also see it as potentially, um, if not done right it might actually be an impediment to innovation um, in terms of, uh, yes, there's a potential, there's an opportunity for Africa to be the future of machine learning, but I don't think it's a guarantee. I just think it's, a, it's an opportunity. So how we come up with creative ways to design our data protection and privacy laws when needed is important but also understanding that uh, innovation requires some freedom in terms of like uh, making sure the, as long as this data sets are being used the right way and being used for the right reasons, um, freely giving access to some of those data sets will, will be very important. I, I'm just very nervous of a future where since there are so many countries in Africa, every country has different and complex data privacy laws, almost mimicking how it is to do business where, okay, for me to do something in an African country, I have to reorganize my system. Uh, so I think that that will not be a good future for Africa if that's the direction we're leaning. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope we have good privacy laws uh, data protection laws, but I also hope they're, they're flexible and uh, don't impede innovation. We've also had a lot of opportunities to, to have conversations with startups here in Kenya, such as Utu, and you know, really working around the using decentralization and, um, and blockchain to create trust networks where you could actually um, put the, 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 the data in nodes that you know, you, people always know that there's transparency within that and you protect people's personal information. So I think there's a nexus of technologies that can, can come, come together, um, such as AI and as well uh, as, as blockchain and cloud computing, you know, all this coming together will, will ensure that there'll be a lot more, you know, accountability and transparency with how people's data are using and people will be able to actually continue owning their data. But uh, as, as, as Tunde also mentioned, you know, um, a lot of times innovation moves so fast that legislation um, is supposed to play a catch up game. And when legislation comes at the beginning, you end up stifling innovation a lot of times. And so I think the, the idea here is to have this, you know, um, you know, triple helix that people talk about of government, academia, and, and private sector working together to understand you know, how, how the future should look like and what is be, going to be the most beneficial to society and the businesses. Um, and, and this, we all need to work together to, to deliver on this. But to some extent, there needs to be an opening up of people being able to trust that even though they allow their, their personal data to be used and their privacy to be opened up, then they trust that that data won't be used in a negative way. In the recent past, maybe one, two, three months of this new year and towards the end of last year, we've heard the accusations in artificial intelligence of discrimination. Discrimination in terms of the data sets of an algorithm uh, and how that algorithm was trained. 
And in certain cases, of course, we're aware that this is just an unconscious bias, uh, most likely because the people who trained the AI uh, taught it to spot patterns in habits and features of certain groups of uh, people with a, a lighter skin tone than, than those of us who are represented here today. Uh, but this, of course, means it may not work as well for uh, people who of other skin tones. So my question to the panel is, uh, what unique opportunities do we have here in Africa uh, that might not necessarily exist anywhere else, uh, which might help us to address uh, the inequality in artificial intelligence? Uh, maybe I think the, the biggest part of this is that we have to become part of the conversation. We cannot wait for um, you know, people and companies from other places to come up with solutions for us, because to be honest, it's not top of their mind. It, they're always going to be thinking about challenges in their environment first. And so, you know, when we have our, you know, people who are connected to the continent who are there, I mean, Tunde is an example. He, he mentioned that, you know, he knows also a lot of people that they've been, they've worked, they grew up in Africa and then now they've worked all over the world. I think what we need is we need our own voices in these um, conversations and we need also to build our own startups which are tackling problems which are unique to the continent. So one thing that we definitely have, which I think is in abundance um, also in other places, but particularly here on the continent is we have an abundance of, of young people. So we're the youngest continent on, on the planet. That means we have a lot of people who are willing to learn and engage with the technologies as Tunde and Eunice mentioned. Um, so all these young people, they're going to start getting engaged with, um, with artificial intelligence. I remember I engaged with the first chatbot when I was about 12 years old. I think it was Eliza, I found it on a computer. So if more and more young people are getting involved with um, AI from when they're nine years old or when they're six years old, right? They'll look at the challenges in their environment and start building solutions for that. So the question of bias will become one of the past because we'll be building solutions for ourselves. Maybe now the challenge will be that our systems will be biased to our challenges and not work in other places. But now, well, that's now a problem now other people will need to deal with, but we will be developing so solutions for ourselves. But again, we're in a flat world, so we'll be able to collaborate with everybody and you know, make sure that the solutions are, are useful for everyone. But again, as we know, AI is very con contextual a lot of times if you want to really build a specific model uh, for something, because we currently just have mainly narrow AI and not AGI yet. So I think the, the biggest opportunity we have is that the amount of young people we have on the continent who are going to start thinking about the problems in their environment and are going to get introduced to the technology. And that's when we'll be, we'll be part of the conversation and build solutions for ourselves. Well, I, I think uh, Mutembe said a lot of valuable things I think um, uh, we, we have to do. So definitely, um, uh, that's why I founded Affluence to make sure that uh, uh, there's a space for African voices and African minds to flourish as well. Uh, so, and I think uh, having places like this on the continent just make common sense as well. Uh, but uh, I also have a, like, I think we need to make the case from both angles. And I think I would maybe just go slightly further than uh, what Mutembe mentioned in terms of, I actually think that um, there's a lot of, like I was telling someone recently, like, I think the world needs Africa to work in terms of a lot of problems that actually go on in other parts of the world. The answers are in Africa in some cases, right? So viewing Africa as a place for knowledge creation and knowledge discovery and innovation it's just common sense. And I think people like us who live outside Africa also need to make a stronger cases um, for this type of thinking. Um, so like for me, I, I definitely, I was frustrated growing up uh, when I couldn't uh, find uh, good jobs as a software engineer back on the continent. So I, I know that's changed definitely. Um, but in general, I agree with all Mutembe has said. Uh, we need to build our own startups and learn some of these uh, issues. Um, and 
it's it's a lot of it is on unco unconscious bias. I think another thing of the question of bias is I was listening to um, our spot of a conversation where we're actually talking about AI and bias, and I think the the moderator there came up with uh, or we came up with like four categories of bias that helped us sort of understand this better. So there's the data bias, which uh, I think a lot of people refer to it as algorithm bias, but we see it more as a data bias and not the algorithms themselves. Um, I think there was also a mention of the <clears throat> uh, inductive bias. There was a mention of the cognitive bias, and there was also a mention of the um, application or deployment bias in terms of like how these models or this AI systems are being used. I think the ones in the middle are more like mathematical concepts, right? So this type of bias is some of them enable us learn because as human beings we all have bias right even in all our communities we know like we think oh this people act a certain way or that people act a certain way and we know these are generalizations but usually that's how the human mind works through bias is how we learn something and over time once we see our bias model does not work we recorrect it uh, but the problem is on the data bias especially for some of these larger companies. For example, I have a friend, she's of a darker skin tone. I was talking to her in a Zoom call and she was using a Zoom effect, which was supposed to blur the background so that her face would be visible. And it was the opposite. <laughs> like I couldn't see her, she was like a ghost. And I'm like, whoa, and this is, and it's, it's something simple, uh, but definitely you see how it definitely was because there were no dark skin tones on the data set, right? So, uh, so th these are challenges where people that have a lot of power, influence, and claim to be global companies need to understand for sure, like their data sets needs to be representative. That's one. And also how these models are being used. I think that's another huge problem because it will, and I think we need to start thinking about this on the African continent as well because we don't want our government adopting or partnering with technologies that reinforce some of this bias in terms of like injustice, right? So if I'm deploying AI for criminal cases and not thinking through like, okay, what does this make sense? Does this apply to context? Is this the type of justice uh, we as Africans want long-term? Does this help us in our continental goals? And questions like this, right? So I think, we really need we really need academics and the best minds to champion uh, this type of thinking. We have one on the global stage, uh, Tim Needs Gerber, and uh, I think Reddit Abebe is also another amazing person. I, they are part of this Black in AI effort. So I think uh, we also need amazing minds on the continent working on this, thinking of this. We'll have a Pan-African mindset to help guide the conversation around bias, both on the global stage and both in the African context, and also in the African context. I think for, for, for these companies that face, that we, we actually see the discrimination and inequality in AI, I think they need to document all the, pros, all the procedures that they think they have taken to minimize bias because if we find that the, the model that they have is biased to maybe the white, then we need to know, did you do all that you could to minimize the bias? Because as, as, as Tunde said, sometimes the, the bias is um, unintentional. You did not intend. So we, we expect to maybe see the documentation and maybe say, yeah, um, it happened. So maybe we can, we can tune we can fine tune the model to reduce the bias uh, also i think i think also the um, we need to as 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 startups in africa uh, as mutembe mentioned we need to have better ways of doing things and considering all the factors also uh, have best practices so that we can be able to combat this unfairness and bias that we've already seen in other models in other countries so yeah i think getting ready and being um is it being 
aware of what the model could do and what bias lies in the model is very important when um, finally deploying your model and saying actually this is how it works so that people are able to know beforehand that this might happen yeah okay thank you thank you so much Eunice as well for giving us uh, that feedback or that view about uh, this hot topic of uh, discrimination in, in AI. And uh, I think it's, it's quite interesting that uh, for, for all the, the answers that, that were shared, uh, we're speaking to people who are not only uh, experts or, or notice, notable uh, practitioners in, in their field, but as well people who have had the experience firsthand of dealing with, um, as uh, Mr. Tunde pointed out, the different types of bias in the different types of areas. So uh, I'm very uh, grateful to all our panelists because we've managed to make it to uh, the end.